the migration program is one of the six uh, research programs of Agora, and so we are the two heads, and uh, we are always looking for new blogs and policy briefs, so also uh, if you're inspired by this discussion or in the future, you're welcome to send us blogs. Um, for example, we've received recently blogs from Tom and Pachi, who Pachi might join us later, and uh, about the topic of uh, how COVID has uh, redrawn the migration landscape of the UK. Uh, in the past, we have also worked on different issues such as detention centers in the UK. Um, so, yes, yeah, so uh, why we have chosen this topic for tonight, I'm just going to say a few words before uh, uh, leaving the floor to Nelly de Nureva. So, it has been said that, I mean, it's a clear fact that COVID has uh, changed a lot of things in the politics and uh, in also in the way mobility works nowadays. But uh, something that's important is, is that it hasn't impacted everyone in the same way. Um, so it is important to, to look at COVID-19 not as something that change, changes things, but that, uh, but that the impact of COVID-19 is mediated by politics and is embedded in historical and sociological trends. Uh, and this is what uh, we need to understand. So for example, it was said that uh, the pandemic was acting as a great leveler. However, we have seen also in the UK how uh, minority groups have been disproportionately impacted. So all that just to say that it's a important moment now to suggest new ways to go forward and suggest policies. And that's why we're really much looking forward to hearing your ideas and suggestions tonight. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today. So Dr. Nelly Demireva is a senior lecturer in sociology at the University of Essex. Her research interests include migration, inter-ethnic ties, social cohesion, ethnic penalties, and multiculturalism. And since September 2015, she has been working on the project GEM, Growth, Equal Opportunities, Migration and Markets, as part of the Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission. And this project addresses the challenges and barriers that European countries face in managing the mobility of persons to realize competitiveness and growth. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Demi Reva. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's great to be thinking, you know, about this important policy aspect. Of, of research. So I'm, I'm a researcher, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm a lecturer, uh, and I spend most of my time um, really kind of trying to go in depth in these issues. And one of the greatest challenges that I find in my research is, you know, some of these um, conclusions that we draw from actually from the data and from what we find, how do we actually put that into a policy perspective. So how then we go to the next step in which we say, uh, well, this is the impact that we see um, and you know, these are the steps that should be taken. And, and this is not an easy thing. So uh, I often think at the end of finishing a paper that actually addressing some of the issues in the paper and trying to, to produce a strategy that will deal with them is not an easy thing. So that's, that would be pretty much um, kind of some of the underlying themes uh, in my uh, in my presentation this evening. And just, you know, to kind of touch on the point of the icebreaker, of what we've all been doing when during COVID-19. Well, actually I've been doing a lot of political cartoons. You can't really see guys, but, you know, I really have been thinking a lot about, you know, these kind of policy issues and, and how do we, um, you know, how do we engage like politically more. So um, uh, I will try to, to touch upon that. So I have prepared a presentation and I'll just try uh, to, um, you know, share my screen with you. Um, yeah. Just assess for some reason on these system preferences. Hmm. Um. Uh, does the, uh, the button uh, share screen? Uh, it just it says open system preferences, security and privacy to grant access. Um, normally it works, I'm just wondering what has happened? Hmm. 
Sorry, I'm on my work Mac. Uh, and again, everything has frozen. So alternative, if you, if you want to, you can um, send it to the email address which I've just shared, and whenever you say next, I can just go to the next slide. Yep. Uh, oh, it, it says I need to quit Zoom. Hmm. Very strange. Um, guys, would you mind if I join you from another computer? Like it might be, or I actually like maybe it's better if I share the presentation very quickly with you. That's actually a great idea. Um, but I will start. So um, in terms of, and you know, try to do simultaneously kind of share the screens with you. That's very weird. Like um, normally, I mean, I share my, uh, oh, I actually can maybe share it with, can I share it for the, no, can't do it for the chat. Okay, I'll send you a quick um, email to Nina and to uh, Shona because that's the easiest maybe. So uh, in terms of the political discourse on migration and multiculturalism, many uh, politicians actually proclaimed the death of multiculturalism and this started pretty much in 2005 and 2010 to in the period from 2005 and 2010. You will have uh, the Trevor Phillips, the, uh, the then um, chief of the Equality and Human Rights Commission saying that Britain is sleepwalking to uh, segregation. And then in 2010, uh, essentially David Cameron uh, kind of further claimed that under the doctrine of state multiculturalism, we have encouraged different cultures to uh, live separate lives apart from each other and apart from the mainstream. So this was the moment in which um, it was pretty much kind of, um, it became part of British uh, standard like, kind of policy to start thinking about different communities and start thinking about these issues of who is integrating, are there like, kind of good um, communities and good individuals within these communities that are integrating and those that are not. And um, this was a sentiment that was not, uh, you know, specific only to the UK. So you have like similar sentiments shared by Angela Merkel, who says that, um, you know, the tendency to adopt a multi culti concept, living happily side by side, uh, this concept has failed. So, you know, you have like similar sentiments, like really politically voiced by politicians, even the Council of Europe has um, come with a, state, a statement that multiculturalism has failed in Europe and has proven to be as harmful as the stimulation approach it replaced. So we saw kind of globally that multiculturalism has really been considered a failure. And in 2014, I published a paper together with uh, Anthony Heath, in which we really took, you know, a lot of these statements made by politicians that most of the time, you know, were at the level of statements. And we considered what is the real evidence behind those statements. So do we see with the data that we have that in fact that there are communities that are not integrating, you know, what would we expect to see? So if in fact multiculturalism has been a failing in Britain, what would we expect to see in the data? So we draw a paper that, you know, just focuses on that. And, you know, our findings can be summarized in the following way. So we found that well, you know, this idea that if people stay only within their communities, if they do not make any contact with the wider society, that means that they're failure, you know, that's an integration failure. 
we found no evidence of that. So people who, who were bonding in their communities, for example, you know, Pakistani and Bangladeshi um, um, individuals have like a lot of, um, thank you very much. And so if we go on the third slide, uh, essentially, um, so, um, you know, this idea that bonding, you know, is really bad for integration, we didn't find any of these adverse consequences that, you know, for example, David Cameron was projecting that, you know, people are essentially isolating themselves from the mainstream. We, especially in the second generation, and in one of the speeches that Cameron made in 2010, later on equaled by Theresa May when she was the Home Secretary, uh, in uh, again in another immigration speech, uh, in both those uh, cases, you know there was an, um, the assumption that if people are living like in, in segregated communities in which there is a lot of inwards bonding, uh, that would impact upon acquisition of English in the second generation. We found no, absolutely no evidence of that. Uh, in the second generation, for example, within uh, the Muslim Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities, um, where you know level of um, English, I mean English was spoken primarily as as the main language at home, uh, up to something like ninety uh, or hundred percent in many communities. Uh, we also did not find that, you know, that there was this finding that, um, you know, within the Pakistani and Bangladesh community, you have less intermarriage, but it wasn't that people were rejecting the identity or British identity. In fact, you know, there were really high proportions of them were saying, uh, we're using data from the ethnic minority British election study, that you know, they they have like really very high levels of identification in Britain or having multiple identity. They would not contemplate violent protest uh, any more than any other ethnic religious groups. And it was indeed within, for example, the black community, black Caribbean and black African community uh, that you see people that were more likely to engage with protests. And even then, when we presented our study at the policy conference, you know, this we highlighted this uh, satisfaction even then that was very visible with the data found in 2010. Um, you know, we highlighted that, that there is huge dissatisfaction and huge experience of discrimination or reported discrimination in these communities. And, you know, we were, we were then if we're in terms of like kind of policymakers, they took that finding and they're like, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that, you know, um, there is a radicalization in these communities? And we were trying to explain that actually protests are a nonviolent protest, for example, are a way for people to express dissatisfaction and a way for them to, to organize. And I think this is still in the political discourse, this is something that many politicians choose still to ignore. They, they take these findings of protest, they take the findings of dissatisfaction, and they see that as a lack of integration, as being a, a, a way of rejecting the mainstream British society, whereas this is not what actually the data shows. Next slide, please. So, um, more recently, the discourse has shifted from multiculturalism to migration. And it again started with David Cameron um, in the first, you know, even before becoming a prime minister, making a pledge that immigration would be reduced to ten, tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands. I've put some hyperlinks in the presentation so you can go to the original kind of statements and the quotes and check them for yourselves. Um, you know, he pretty much said that this is not unrealistic. This figure was, you know, the 1990s and I think we should see that again. You know, this was 2010. A lot of water has, you know, has passed since the 1990s, especially in the British uh, migration system and in terms of kind of the British labor market. So even the naivete of that statement then um, was conspicuous, was, was pretty much uh, obvious. 
more recently Boris Johnson have also talked about reducing migration, becoming a priority. However, unlike David Cameron, who was very specific, you know, tens of thousands, um, you know, Boris Johnson was much more on the overall number should go down. Uh, and, you know, this idea that the targets uh, and the target you should introduce an Australian style points based system that would actually allow us to, um, you know, to get more highly skilled migrants. Next slide, please. You can think that this is, you know, only, uh, for example, you know, within the conservative political agenda, but this is, this was not necessarily the case. Uh, even Jeremy Corbyn, the then leader of um, the Labour Party, also spoke about undercutting of um, majority workers and um, this idea that underpaid workers from Central Europe, so other European migrants, especially destroy conditions, uh, particularly in the construction in the industry. Um, at the point of, you know, of, the, of some of the most recent reports that have been produced on integration, um, this sentiment of unbridled, of uncontrolled migration is also very much in, in, um, in this report. So I give you uh, one of the quotes from, um, for example, the report on integration of um, immigrants from the old party parliamentary uh, group on uh, social cohesion. And, you know, they, they frequently talk about, for example, like, you know, one place, um, you know, um, all the Bostonians that complain there about the arrivals of many newcomers, about these young people, their children, their grandchildren, um, and then, you know, the inability of people today buy a property in the town to find a job. So this idea that, you know, very much the migrants, and specifically, so not all, every kind of migrant, but specifically uh, the so-called deemed or termed well-skilled migrants, that are undercutting, you know, potential conditions for other people that that are uh, struggling. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. So in in this slide, I want to show you first of all how illusionary, um, and you know, this idea that uh, net migration to the UK could really, um, you know, be reduced, but dramatically reduced. Uh, so we saw a reduction, and that's pretty much the EU referendum. Uh, but this reduction is not so much driven by kind of stricter controls, but also like of the huge role that climate of reception has to play. So, um, you know, the fact that, that uh, post the referendum, a lot of, you know, um, immigrants no longer felt that they are welcome, you know, they had like very strong signals from um, essentially from the government that made them reconsider their positioning in, um, in the in, in, the, in the UK. And in fact, you know, if you see the, the three lines, so if you see the, uh, the immigration, the immigration, and, you know, kind of, you know, the difference between the two, which is the net migration, you see that, I mean, immigration really fluctuates. Uh, and it's not that, you know, you can really reduce it to the tens of thousands. So th that's, you know, completely a goal that's not and, and cannot really be uh, accomplished in any, in any way. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, there could be unintended consequences, essentially, of trying to, to really control migration and to, to try, um, well, not so much control migration, because I don't actually think that there has been so much control of migration. Migration is being managed through the migration system and the visa system. Um, it is, you know, controls are in place. I never, I don't think that there is a lot of evidence to suggest that migration has been running rampant and unbridled uh, in the UK. In fact, the evidence is uh, that, you know, the systems that are in place are functioning uh, as predicted. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, on this slide, I've used some of the, um, uh, um, the labor force survey data. So this is uh, some of my own analysis in which I try to show the share of migrants in different occupations. So why the uh, focus on well-skilled migrants? Well, because the share of well-skilled migrants in the UK has not been going down, it has been dramatically increasing over time. So the graph has on the y-axis, you know, essentially kind of the proportion uh, or the share of migrants in, in a variety of these occupations. And here, you know, I've used here some school coding. I've only looked at three classes in order to make the graph manageable. And we have like with the purple, the professional and managerial. And then um, with kind of the bluish, the intermediate occupations and the manual and elementary occupations. And the share of migrants, I meaning all these occupations have been increasing over time. So, you know, that's the first trend that has to be noticed. Um, and there is a rise and, you know, there is a conspicuous rise uh, for, for, for all of these uh, kind of, you know, occupational groupings, but particularly so among the manual and elementary uh, occupations. So I think, you know, this is the point in which when politicians see that graph, and a lot of them have done uh, this analysis independently, and you know they have civil servants that produce uh, the same estimates for them, they have looked at it and 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 they have thought, wow, you know, well-skilled migration has run amok. We need to put uh, a system in place. I think you know the story is much more complicated than that. You know, there is a variety and changing nature of work, changing nature of uh, conditions. Uh, and in fact, in my research, I try to show that. Um, you see kind of a bifurcation of jobs in which, you know, there seems to be some jobs at the top, at the professional level, and lots of kind of jobs uh, at the bottom. And migrants need for, for kind of, you know, uh, for, for both uh, kinds. And so that's why, you know, it's kind of the intermediate one. There aren't that many intermediate positions. I mean, even they are increasing, but actually migrants don't have access to them. So the system, you know, essentially, you know, puts the demand, puts uh, some of the people in the low skilled positions, but there is a demand also for the highly skilled um, kind of migrant workers from which growth and um, innovation comes, comes through. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. And, you know, this idea the wall skilled migrants do not really contribute had really, so COVID-19, here is why my, my talk really turns to COVID-19, because, you know, COVID-19 really turned this idea that wall skilled migrants are not contributors. It turned it, you know, pretty much on its head. Because in fact, a lot of the people that, you know, are still needed and could continue to, to work and to perform basic services are within, you know, or can be classified and, as more skilled migrants, especially within the caring um, and the sector that is most hit by COVID-19, which is uh, essentially home caring providers. Um, which, you know, uh, most of them are migrant, or a majority of them are migrant workers, particularly migrant women, the proportion of migrant women there is really very high. Uh, this is where you also have the, one of the highest proportion of uh, COVID-19 deaths. So, um, you know, this idea that you know, these migrants are not essential, so, you know, there has been an immediate shift from these migrants being um, described as kind of well skilled uh, workers to pretty much defined as um, essential workers. You know, uh, people that are working in caring, at the, at the low level jobs, but also kind of nurses and medical professionals are more high skilled in the transportation system. Um, you know, people that are in the warehouses that, you know, make sure that parceling and delivering, you know, still continues, we now think of them as essential workers. And a lot of these people are actually are not having access to the mainstream. 
So some of them do because you know some of them are from other EU countries, but that's not necessarily the case for all of them. So you have like kind of a vast swath of people that are non-EU uh, migrant workers that the long-term work visa system really excludes. They do not have a path towards a citizenship. They do not have a path towards, you know, kind of bringing their uh, families. Uh, they would, in order for the British government, and, and there is this great paper, that um, uh, this great work done uh, by uh, Marina fernandez Reino, Madeleine Samtion, and Carlos Vargas Silva at Oxford, um, who really showed that, you know, the government should really consider what do they do with this, uh, these workers if they really want to, to kind of um, show that they, they value their contribution. And one of the um, uh, issues that was debated even today is the NHS uh, surcharge. So a lot of these migrants, even though, you know, um, Boris Johnson has said that they should not pay the surcharge since uh, 21st of May or they will be reimbursed, that hasn't happened. And they're still paying uh, essentially the NHS surcharge, even though they're essential and, and they are uh, contributing to the system. So, you know, we can really see this as a failure of imagination. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm coming towards the end of my uh, presentation. So uh, even if we take Brexit as an example, uh, you know, the idea that migration is the problem for, for things and the satisfaction of political uh, movements such as Brexit, even that's not necessarily the case, because if you look at some of the places that have voted for Brexit, um, you know, and you had like very high turnouts, these are not places in which there are any migrants or in fact the proportion of migrants or non-majority members is very, very little. Next slide, please. In comparison places in which, um, you know, there are many more migrants, you know, there, there were the places that were remainers. And this was because some of them were citizens, actively meaning that they have actively integrated within Britain and have become British. Um, or um, in fact, or maybe not just not, you know, being recognizing themselves as white British. Um, okay, so um, next slide, please. Thank you. So what do we do? So in my project, in the GEM project, and please do check it out, we really have amassed a vast majority of data. So we had like secondary data analysis, we've analyzed all kinds of European and UK based data. So we had like, on one hand, we have the uh, secondary data, we had field experiments. So we can actually see and talk about discrimination and we do find discrimination very, actually very high levels of discrimination, especially towards a uh, black man in the UK. So I thought I was this always, you know, in terms of like kind of the data that we have collected, uh, I think this, this has been an extraordinary finding. Next slide, please. Um, but we also collected a lot of interviews. So we did like about two, um, 236 interviews with all kinds of different migrants uh, throughout Europe and throughout the UK. And final slide of the presentation. So I just wanted to show you kind of one of the quotes um, from a nurse, so a health practitioner, um, who, you know, who has moved to London. So this is a person, and this is a kind of a very poignant quote, that, you know, in fact, like somebody that had credentials and had qualifications, and normally you would expect that within a system, within a migration system, when it's working properly, it would allow those individuals that are, you know, are actually able to come and are allowed to come, would then allow and speed the process of their integration. So, you know, would offer help, for example, with the translation of their degrees, um, would, um, you know, essentially uh, make sure that, you know, they can access work and they, they have like the right requirement. And essentially in this quote, you have the struggle of this woman. I mean, at a certain point, she worked as a dishwasher. And during the interview, she almost like cried 
and cried with the frustration and cried with, you know, with the fact that even though she had a degree and she considered herself highly capable and she could read all these uh, documents, she, like any other migrant, like any other well skilled migrant, just didn't have access to the information. So at a certain point, she, you know, she just was like, well, nothing you can do. I would spend more money, I would go back to Italy, you know, had again certifying my documents, then coming back to London, trying to validate them again, trying to find another agency, again paying, you know, for all these translations. And all, you know, this process took more than uh, three months. Um, you know, in terms of her tenure, she had to put in that CV these months in which essentially like she was not working instead of saying, oh, I've been unemployed. She, is, she worked for this um, uh, restaurant. So I think, you know, in terms of like kind of policy, it is those cases that also has to be considered. It's a failure really of a system um, when, um, you know, there is a lot of talk about controlling the numbers because you know that's an easy headline, but there are many more very important questions there, which are related to the price that people pay in the migration process, and and that really subsequently uh, is related to their integration and their future prospects. So thank you very much. This is what I wanted to outline in my presentation. Thank you.